This episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. And by Ting.com. Head over to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Linux Action Show, Season 30, Episode 1. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Good morning to you, Matt. Good morning. Should I tell folks about our big show this week? Oh, yeah. Huge show this week. Mm -hmm. So uh, coming up in the second half of the show, we're going to review the System76 Leopard Extreme, their top dog, top of the line desktop, and we're going to put it through its paces right here on the show. And we've got some good stuff lined up for that. But of course, in the news segment, we're also going to talk about SteamOS, got a roundup of the stories, mm -hmm. some of the surprises that came out, what we now know, and how you can get your hands on it despite some limitations like maybe not having UEFI or having an AMD card in your system. These are all things that otherwise won't work with SteamOS, but there are ways to make it work, mm -hmm. and we'll give you a roundup on all of that stuff as well. In the feedback segment, we've got a follow-up on switching the yep. ladies over to Linux. There was a guy who wrote and said, I got my awesome. girlfriend a new computer, but... Uh, I think I want to put Linux on it. Nice. We gave him some suggestions, and yeah. I think it kind of worked out. So we'll do cool. a follow-up. But first, it is our picks, as is always. And, Matt, I wanted to start with our Runs Linux. Yeesh. That's tradition. Absolutely. All right. Well, so this week, our Runs Linux is a great one. It's the uh, Isaac Newton Telescope. Whoa, it, really? And it runs Fedora Linux on that. And not just Fedora Linux, Matt, hmm. but uh, thanks to uh, Kenny on Twitter who sent this in. Here is uh, a screen oh, cap whoa. of it running, of all things, KDE. No kidding. Right there, Fedora. Well, you know, KDE. if you're going to rock a telescope, it really needs to have those desktop widgets. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean clearly. And, I mean, because you, obviously. And uh, I like that uh, they, they kind of broke with trend and they put the clock on that's the left cool. side. That's cool. Well, that's how telescopes roll. They're ballsy like that. Yeah. They, they, the did, time they just matters. get it done. Yeah. They, exactly. They just get it done. Uh, this is this goes in great with the uh, recent examples we've had of uh, just like Linux cropping up in all of these organic places on TV. It's like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, well here we are in an engineering lab, or here we are right. in a science lab. There was a, there's a video in the uh, Linux Action Show subreddit right now that is um, one of the uh, top supercomputers, and it's really just a bunch of Linux boxes, and they walk Ooh. through it, and they have all these fans in there. Nice. So if you haven't seen that yet, that's what that that one almost made it. Uh, I just, I loved this one so much because I'm kind of a space nerd. That so. would be cool. Although, I would also be okay with the Linux running in an insane asylum. I don't know why, but that just sounds like it'd be really fun. Well, you got to run something, Matt. Right. Gotta, you got to keep those folks uh, running Linux. Sometimes we call this an insane asylum. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. So, uh, big, big week this week. Next week, huge week, too. In fact, I'm going to try to give some details in the feedback segment. If you don't normally watch live, next week will be the week to watch any of our shows live because there's just going to be a lot going on. I'm a little hungover. I yeah, yeah, and I'm uh, I've had a very long week myself. Not uh, to uh, take away from that because hungover trumps every time. But no, but, but I'm did, definitely a notch below. You I've did got, have a big week, so. or, well, not a great week actually. Not a great week. No. Uh, we're in we're in the process of recovery. I'm uh, yeah, you know, picked up a couple gigs here and there, and we're kind of patching Good. along here. But yeah, we're uh, you know we're getting there. I um, went uh, last night on my uh, annual uh, <laughs> Christmas <laughs> shopping great trip. Oh my god! And you know what it was? You know what was really strange? And I'm not. I'll just. This is just an exercise for the uh, video listeners. But I was just walking through a Spencer's, and then all of a sudden, oh, you you went through Spencer's, and did you didn't take your family through Spencer's? Well, no, it was okay. just me. Okay, that's I probably just, a good. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, we like to go. I didn't and, know they sell um, adult toys. Oh yeah, my nephew and I have been known to sword fight with them. Yeah. I well, I mean, if you, I suppose they they have all kinds of accessories. So <laughs> he's yeah. almost eighteen. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, no, they've got some. Uh, well, you know, actually, I would totally rock those. And look all at the uh, I, the G plus. Uh, Ooh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, of course, you know, to shop, you got to have a little liquid courage. And, Absolutely, uh, it helps, especially Spencer's. It kind of helps you. Yeah. Reach through the door there, and oh, I would totally take that. That cut out. I know, right? Oh man, I know. And I mm. like that Ron Burgundy is reading a book about himself. So I'm here though. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I showed up for work, and I actually I feel I feel okay. I feel okay. But if I accidentally call uh, Linux GNU slash Linux, you'll understand. Or Windows or Mac right, or something. Right. It's okay. I, I, you'll understand the, the yeah. slip up. You'll forgive. I hope. All right, Matt. Well, uh, before we jump into our other picks this week, I want to thank our first sponsor, and that is GoDaddy.com. Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. And their website builder makes it easy to create your own website, put your business online, and find nice. new customers. You can choose from hundreds of customizable designs, and then you're on your way. Website builder even includes a free domain, hosting, and 24-7 nice. support. Yeah, the domain and the support. What's up? But you know how much it costs? A dollar per month when you use our promo code WSB6. You're going out on the holidays, folks. Mm. The family's going to ask you, because you know you're the tech guy in the family, right? Man. I can picture it now. You're sitting around the table, and what happens? 
What happens? They're going to oh, ask yeah. you tech questions. Exactly. And, you're, and you better have answers. You, you got to have answers. That's right. And that's well, what GoDaddy comes you know, in. Exactly. WSB6, you get them for mm-hmm. a year with the website, a, a nice UI to set it all up, SEO optimization, and a mobile version. You really can't beat that. Yep. So big thank you to GoDaddy. Go over there. Also, warn your family that Jean-Claude might do the splits on their face. This is right. They you don't know. do it. And if you don't, don't apply that code, the crotches are coming. And the worst part is he's a busy man. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't I mean, have time to splits on everybody's head. Yeah, I mean, he Nothing loves do. doing it. Yeah. I mean, he's a driven man, but uh, yeah, yeah. He, he basically is cream of the crop. You know, it's like you know, I think you're worth it, but you, I'm going to have to come back to. Yeah, saying there you go. Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Go Daddy. <laughs> so this week, uh, for some of the uh, back end encoding jobs, well, actually, pretty much for everything. Yeah. Uh, I use FFmpeg. An amazing, amazing command line utility for mm-hmm. Linux. Just amazing. And it's available on other operating systems, too. I uh, So um, to benchmark the Leopard Extreme this week was throwing all kinds of FFmpeg jobs right. out. Right. And uh, FFmpeg has a lot of flags you can do to oh, get yeah. different quality results. And, like, the smallest, smallest tweak can totally change the quality mm-hmm. or the, the amount of time it takes right. to encode, you know, something like that. And it can be tricky to get right. So this week, um, I didn't want to make FFmpeg the pick itself. That's kind of the meta pick sure, for this week. Sure. But uh, I wanted to point people over to the FFmpeg little helper. Little it, helper. It's huh? a. It's a. It's basically the FFmpeg command generator. Oh God, this is great. Yeah, I would. T- oh man, I used right? the hell out of this. Right. So uh, oh. and now the some of the flags might be a little bit different depending on your wow. version of, of FFmpeg. But you you can choose from an MP4 file. Uh, a DV mm-hmm, file mm-hmm. or a, or an Og Vorbis file, right? You got all these options in here, or you can mux an MP4 to Flash if you'd want. This to is great, reason. so you're no longer dependent on those gooey wraparounds that they got for FFmpeg. Yeah, and, you can actually rock this out. And the nice thing is, is like yeah. what I did is I use this to just kind of uh, fact check my commands and say right. what are they doing. So like here, mm-hmm. I can say, you know, I want to make it uh, 720p. Right. And uh, I can say, uh, make it widescreen. Mm-hmm. Um, frame rate, if I know what it's going to be, in my case, it's going to be 30. Mm-hmm. And uh, I want a stereo 44. And you can also even have it start in on a few spots. So like, what's really cool is if <sighs> we were just sitting down here and just recording a single file and we knew we needed to chop off the yeah. first 30 seconds and the last 30 seconds, you could you could pipe that into here. Uh, you just put it in here and put it in here, and then FFmpeg will start encoding at those points. Oh, it's almost really cool. like a pre-edit. I mean, yep. that's great. Yep. It's just, it's, if that's all you need, it saves you from bringing oh, it into man. the editor. Uh, there's some other options in here, like some basic uh, ranges. Mm-hmm. Like you can say my target bit rate is a megabit, but then of course you could go in here and tweak that a little bit. Right. Uh, you can choose your uh, audio bit rate. Let's say maybe 96 hertz. And then what's really cool is you give it the file name. So I'll say Bob <laughs> dot MP4, right? Mm-hmm. And then we'll put the output as uh, Bob uh, dash HD dot MP4, right? And, right? and this could be this this might be an MOV file. This might be an AUG file. This might be an AV file. It could be any kind of input file. Mm-hmm. And then when you click generate, it gives you the straight up FFmpeg command. You could, oh, dude, you could just copy and paste that into um, your uh, your command line if sure, you wanted sure. to. Just CD into the directory you need. And yeah, it, yeah, yep. And as long as wherever Bob did MP4 mm-hmm. is, you can run. It'll also generate you a Bash script or a uh, Linux batch file if you're one of them. Nice. And oh, can, dude, seriously? Yep. So you can see there it is oh, with the man. batch version. Now just double check some of these commands. Not not every FFmpeg. Uh, version has the same syntax, but it gets you going in the right oh, direction. Oh, sure. And I'm sure there's going to be instances to where just because you can select it as an option doesn't mean it's going to actually give you the desired output. Yeah. You know, yeah, a little so, experimentation. Um, and, you know, like I did, is I, was, I just did, well, how's their stuff stack up to how my stuff stacks up? Right. Uh, and there's also an FFmpeg command to give you all the available codecs that it has, and you can swap out, like, you know, in here they have libx264, but I could also put webm in there, Ooh, right, or something yeah. like that. Cool. So uh, the URL is kind of uh, wonky, but I'll put a link to it in the show notes if mm-hmm. you guys want to go check it out. It's FFmpeg, a little helper. That is awesome. Yeah. All right, Matt. Well, uh, I've been having, I still can't get backup off the brain. Oh, yeah? So I think maybe we'll do an episode on it pretty soon. Very cool. But I wanted to point folks over to uh, a bare metal recovery solution. Because mm-hmm. there's, there's a lot of ways to back up your data. Mm-hmm. I mean, really just straight up, you know, r syncing over to your file server from time to time is not really a backup. No. At least no. something. Um, and there's, of course, there's Spider Oak, and again, like that's what I use, mm-hmm. but that just takes the data offsite. And you know, when you're doing like something like an arch setup here, like this, you got a really nice arch rig right here. Oh yeah. And uh, this guy, it, it took you know, I don't know, a uh, couple of hours to set up. And mm-hmm. it, you know, if I wanted to save myself a couple of hours of time, um, I would, I could just do a whole bare metal backup and restore of this guy if I screw something up, right? Which would be great because then it's like, okay, boom, done. Yeah. Bam, get back to work. So the uh, the project I want to point folks over to this week is called Relax and Recover at relax and 
Relax-Recover.org. I'll tell you, the name's certainly speaking to me. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, Relax and Recover is a, stri- a setup and forget it Linux bare metal disaster recovery solution, and it's easy to set up and requires no maintenance. So they, as the author puts it, there's no excuse not to use it. Yeah. They've got a little video here on their site. Uh, this is a full, this is without any cheating. It's only four minutes long, and it is a complete backup and restore demo. Uh, you can wow. create ISO images, and you can store them on a central server. You can integrate with an existing backup solution. You could just save to a USB thumbstick if you wanted to. Wow. It it manages you know the partitioning. It manages making the partition bootable. It and then it manages the restoration. <laughs> nice. yeah. yeah, really, you know, it really is a relax and recover kind of setup. Right. So, uh, and there's there's a tutorial, and it, you know, I I think it's actually pretty straightforward. The one thing you kind of might want to do is is read through on the syntax a little bit, but uh, mm-hmm. the commands look really easy. Like. Uh, like, oh yeah, where you're writing your MBR and all that. Yeah, yeah, little, yeah. little things like that. Yeah. You just kind of want to double check. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, it, it, they even give you some some example config files here mm-hmm. on the page. And uh, but it I, seems pretty straightforward, yeah. as you said. It might be a contender when we're doing our backup and recovery, like our full backup recovery. Mm-hmm. I want to do an episode where it's like put a disc in and recover the machine. Exactly. Kind of stuff. It's like new drive, boom, bam. That could be it. That Con- could be the way it. to go. All right, Matt, one last thing I just wanted to plug real quick and mention, because it is the final hours. In fact, I'm sure by the time the bulk of people are watching this episode, it will be over for sure. Uh, But if you go to teespring.com slash Jupiter2014, check it out. That is crazy. This is the the final day. We knew it would end today on Sunday. I didn't know quite when, but it it has six hours and 42 minutes left. Mm. We have sold... 975 towards our goal of 499 shirts. That's so awesome. Almost 1,000. That would have been amazing if we would have got to 1,000, but 975 is incredible. Of course, uh, if you watched last week, you know that we added hoodies. We also added a ladies' tee. And uh, we've got just a short sleeve, too, if you don't want long sleeve. So uh, if you want to grab one and you're watching this within six hours of this airing, Go to teespring.com slash Jupiter2014. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll be the one that gets us to 1,000. Uh, that would be awesome. And I, th- I think you seem to remember this being a limited time thing. So this is a one-shot deal. Yeah. This is it. You want one. Be one of us. Chat room yeah. wants to hit 1024. That's funny. Mm. That's awesome. Mm. <laughs> you know, we should mention yeah, uh, the right. Linux Action Show is live on Sundays at 10 a.m. Pacific over jblive.tv. Jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar is where you want to go to get it in your time zone. It's probably not a bad idea to just go there in general over the next couple of weeks because yeah. of the holidays. Uh, like next week, we'll be live at our regular time, but the episode will be coming out hours later. Uh, oh, yeah. I have a family thing I'm going to, and so we won't. It won't affect the airing time of the show, but it will affect, uh, affect the release time of the show. So if you're hardcore and don't want to delay, best watch live next week over at Live TV. Right. All right, Matt. Let's do the news. The news in this episode is brought to you by Ting.com. Ting is mobile that makes sense. No contracts, no early termination fees, and you only pay for what you use. Also, no bundling or ride-along services, and you also get free hotspot and tethering included with your plan. You just pay for the data usage like part of your regular old cell service. It kind of makes sense. Ting likes to think of himself as a mobile ISP in a lot of ways. And uh, one of the things that's really key to that whole aspect is really the way they charge. They o- You get uh, as many lines on an account as you want which is great for small businesses, family, or even in my case where I've just got uh, a couple of phones that I use for testing out different Jupyter Broadcasting things. Uh, I have all of these on one account sharing pooled minutes, only $6 a month per line, and then I just pay for the individual usage of each phone. And they take the minutes, the messages, and the megabytes at the end of the month, and they add it up, whatever bucket you fall into, that's what you pay. And of course, Ting has an awesome, powerful online control panel where you can take control of your account, your usage, and your bills in all one single spot, and they combine that with a great app and fantastic customer service. You call them at one eight five five ting ftw Anytime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern, and a real Canadian answers the phone. Woo-hoo. Yes, man. And you know what? Yeesh. Those Canadians are good looking, too. I'll tell you that. Here's a couple of... So oh, I yeah. uh, I uh, took the Nexus 5 out. You got the Note 2 over there, yeah. both on Ting. I took the Nexus 5 out last night on my shopping trip. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'll show some pictures to the live stream here in a little bit. And I also, uh, for the Leopard Extreme, all of the shots of the internals, which I'll show in a little bit in the show, were taken on the Nexus 5. And I got to say, the right new on. Android update... Really improved the camera on the Nexus oh, yeah. Five. There's some autofocus issues. It never really affected me that much, but I definitely noticed an improvement now. Uh, so I, I really like, the, and I, I really like the Nexus Five now. And I, I wanted to show you this too. Oh. When you order something from Ting, 
They send it in this Ting portfolio. Oh, that's cool. It's got a little Ting tab on the side there. Right, right. And they put, uh, like, the billing and shipping stuff. uh, They put the shipping stuff in here, and you can pull it out. And you can use this for anything, and it's really nice. Um, It's got uh, a nice cloth interior. You could could totally put, like, a tablet in here. Right, I was going to say, that'd be tablet perfect. Yeah. Uh, And, uh, oh, look, it even came with a little Ting card. Look at that. I didn't notice that. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Thank Neat. you for your order. And then they tell you where to go to get the uh, phone That's activated. That's awesome. And it just kind of shows you the attention to quality. Ting, mm. Because Ting is an MVNO, and if you have good Sprint service in your area, you'll have great Ting service. And because Ting is able to focus on the phones and the customer mm-hmm. service, they do all of those things really, really, really well. That's their core competency. That's why I love them. And the no contracts. The fact that I feel like I'm actively participating in making that choice. I'm not being manipulated into going down a certain plan, Mm -hmm. paying a certain amount that I don't use up. I look at it like this. Mobile phones are becoming a new generation of a computing platform that we all have in our pocket. And one of the exciting things, I I have qualms with Google, but at the same time, one of the exciting things they're doing with their Nexus line is they are pushing the high end market into a more, um, comfortable price point for a yeah. lot of folks and i think when you combine the fact that you just go to uh, the google play store and you buy this phone and it doesn't have any uh, any carrier or oem crap on it it is just a pure google experience and then you take it over to a to a network like ting which is also a very pure experience where you are in control and where they respect mm-hmm. you and they treat you well you pay for what you use there's no contracts the two it, it really is an amazing marriage uh, if you're a big podcast listener or an audiobook listener i i really still recommend the htc1 man are the speakers on oh, that yeah. thing fantastic so to go get started go to last.ting.com. That'll take $25 off your first device or $25 off your first month of service if you have a Sprint compatible phone. And if you're in a term if you if you have an early termination fee from your existing mobile provider, Ting has an early termination relief program where they'll give you up to $75 per line that you have to get canceled. To just go try things out if you've been thinking about it, go check out their savings calculator, plug in your information there and see what you're going to, you know, you see Definitely. maybe what you're going to save. And what this is look at this. This is one of the really nice things is Ting has uh, site-wide notification banners they can put up. Oh, that's great. So if there's like something you need to be aware of that's coming up, maybe related to a holiday or whatever, yep. you know it's going down. And these can be general for every Ting mm-hmm. customer, or they can be specific to my account. So when I'm logged into the Ting dashboard uh, and I visit the site, if I still am logged in, they'll put up like, your Nexus has shipped. Your Nexus SIM has shipped. Like they, I, I can also get account-related specific notifications up there. It's done really well. It's not obtrusive. It's not annoying. It's very clean. Mm-hmm. Ting's uh, dashboard uses all web standards. They, uh, the um, the Mozilla authentication system. They use that if you want to if you want to log in with that instead of creating an account, which I Love think is that. brilliant. Yeah. So many great things about Ting. So go get started by going to last.ting.com. And a huge thank you to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Oh, definitely, they really get the users. Awesome. Let's dig into all this SteamOS stuff. I man. know, right? Oh boy, it's like Christmas came early. <laughs> SteamOS beta is here. And oh, uh, there are some caveats. Mm. I think the big surprise is that it requires UEFI to boot. I uh, did not expect that. I had a yeah. I had a rig set aside to be my dedicated Steam machine. Mm-hmm. It does not have UEFI. Yeah, I don't um, understand what they're. Well, they they have reasons. It's got to be. The, yeah, I, yeah. There's probably it's probably just because they it's a good cutoff point for modern hardware. Sure. Um, and the other thing that was a bit of a surprise, although a lot of speculation around it, not too surprising, I suppose, is it's based on Debian Wheezy. Mm-hmm. Uh, they swapped out the uh, standard 3.2 kernel that ships with Debian Wheezy and gone with a 3.10 kernel from the uh, nice. Ubuntu. Or, I'm sorry, from the Debian repos. Mm-hmm. Has real time patches applied to it, which is uh, which are from Debian. And then uh, Valve has applied a few minor patches to it, but it's pretty close to the stock Debian experience. The Wheezy underpinnings itself, mm-hmm. which are pretty interesting, are. Uh, very bare, like no text editors, wow. um, no no Debian repos, no nothing. And uh, I'll link you guys to a uh, I got I got a I got an ISO that I found online. There's I got a whole bunch of links for this stuff that we'll go through some of this. But uh, here is a bootable ISO image because right now when you download this from Valve, it is a zip file. That you're oh, really? then supposed to extract onto a USB thumb drive. Hmm. That's fine and all, but sure. uh, if you wanted to try it out. Now, uh, I'm going to do this in VirtualBox just to demonstrate to you guys. You're going to have a bad time of VirtualBox. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have the right video card. It, it, it's not going to obviously have very good performance. But one of the things you can do in VirtualBox is you can get under the hood and play with the GNOME desktop. Oh, so that's cool. It's, it's very minimum Debian, except it has GNOME 3.4. That's interesting. It's which a, it's, which huh. is like this current version for, for uh, Debian. Right. Um, yeah. And the other thing that was kind of, I thought, weird and interesting choice that they made there was 
Steam, oh, the Steam UI, which is really just Steam in big picture. Mm-hmm. So if you have Steam installed, you can go into big picture mode and you essentially get the Steam OS experience as it is today. Okay, so really, you're kind of good either way. Yeah. I mean, really, yeah. uh, it, unless you actually are running it on specially designed right. hardware, there's right. no real jumping off point there. Okay. So you can see here, if you're watching huh. the video version, I've got, uh, so uh, when you boot up the Steam OS uh, ISO, it and you go into automatic mode, there's two modes, I went into automatic mode, it just is already partitioned and formatted my hard drive without me ever, pro- never prompted wow. me. So Weird. when you boot this ISO into automatic mode, if it detects your drives, it wipes it. It yeah. doesn't partition it, it wipes it and makes it its own partition. Say it's, it with me, folks. Dedicated machine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you can see right now it's installing the base system yeah. as uh, we go here. And uh, um, when it's done, you'll get essentially, I'm not, I, don't know if, I don't know if this is the right term, but two X sessions. One for the Steam Big Picture mode and then a sure. separate X session for the GNOME desktop. That's interesting. So I wonder if they're like working in conjunction with each other. Or... And the hmm. um, the other thing that was the other thing that uh, that Steam decided to, that Valve decided to go ahead and do is they're using a a a, a, um, a composite manager called XComp MGR. XComp MGR is a simple compositing manager capable of rendering drop shadows and uh, translucent windows. Very kind of uh, proof of concept is what a lot of people mm-hmm. considered as like a competitor to comp is when comp is started to fade. Right. Well, this makes sense because they want these effects. They want the experience, but they also right. want to make sure something that low overhead. Yeah. And quite frankly, that they're, they're, they're running the steering wheel on. They're so running the rudder. It seems that Valve has kind of taken this under their wing a little bit. They've applied mm-hmm. some uh, changes to uh, X comp manager, but it's not totally new. So if you've heard that Steam is using its own... Uh, um, com- compositing manager. It's nothing that they created out of whole cloth. It's something okay. that's existing. They basically are borrowing from an existing project yeah, uh, and building from it. And, you know, we have folks in the Linux Action Show audience, I'm sure, who are probably using it on Arch right now under, oh. uh, like, i3 or Awesome or something like that. Oh, and that way okay. they, can, they can run Awesome and have transparent terminals and, and things like that. So it's, it, it's something that's been around for a while. Uh, it was an interesting choice by Valve to go with that. And I think the primary X desktop is not using it, but I think that special Steam session is using it. I, I don't know for sure. Yeah. And here's the here's here's kind of so here's kind of the requirements. You need to have a 64-bit PC. Okay, it needs to be um, uh, UEFI capable. And mm-hmm. right now, it needs an NVIDIA video card in it for yes. you to be able to put SteamOS in and just boot it up and have it work. And I've also read, and I don't know if this is true or not, it also needs to be Intel-centric uh, as far as the... Uh, I don't know if yeah, that's... I don't know. I might be, I, I, I've read, I I've read mixed Intel, results so. on that. So, I mean, I think for most people, that's probably not, not if, an issue. You'll notice, too, it's actually installing the ATI. Uh, it, uh, it just installed the uh, proprietary AMD ATI. ATI graphics driver, so it is actually on the SteamOS system. They're there. just only say, they're only claiming NVIDIA support right now, maybe for support purposes. That's probably allows them to perfect the NVIDIA experience, yeah. and then they can you know bounce from that. Uh, this truly is though essentially a a very stripped down Debian OS. Um, what do you think about that, Matt? Some I you know boy, I, I boy, really boy. thought it was going to be based. I thought what it would be was Ubuntu twelve oh four with all of the branding removed. I thought they would mm. like pull a CentOS on Ubuntu. Because they have been they have been pushing everyone to develop and test under 1204 32-bit. You know, I'm trying to remember back, because I know I made a prediction on this in the life of me. I can't remember. Maybe you guys can as to what whether or not they're going to be running on Ubuntu or not. I think that I I think that I actually did say they probably weren't, but I could be wrong. I don't I, remember. I, I feel like you, you said I, I, I wish like I could you remember. said they weren't, and I said they would. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, that may have been it. I, I you know, but now I'm at the end of the day, am I surprised that they're not running on Ubuntu based on what I've seen thus far, especially? No, I can see the advantages of going to something like Debian because it's basically you're not dealing with a company involvement other than themselves. They're right. basically in the driver's seat. They can right. do whatever the hell they want to it. No one's gonna, I don't know, charge them for packages or whatever. I've argued um, before like that, I've so. argued before that I yeah. felt like Canonical yeah. being behind Ubuntu was one of the reasons Valve felt comfortable committing to a distro that had right. commercial backing. At the same time, a lot has changed yeah. since that happened. And I wonder if Valve watched this and thought, watched everything that's happened in the last year and thought, you know, if we're going to be in this for the really long haul, like this mm-hmm. Steam, when they launched Steam, the game distribution platform, on day one, Valve acknowledged internally, this is a 10-year process. It's going to take us 10 years to make this the market-dominant dominant, uh, game distribution platform. And if they're looking at SteamOS with the same 10-year long-term, like, it's going to take 10 years before it's really top dog, yep. then it makes so much sense to go with Debian. Even though Debian is, 
Um, sometimes a bit behind, you know, in terms of like the libraries that latest games need to use and things like that. But they're going to provide their own repos that's to accommodate just that. It. That's just it. I think that's the meat and potatoes of it right there is that rather than putting their dependencies into one hat, they're going with Debian because then they can control the brakes and the accelerator and exactly what they want is it to do. Is this a combination, though, of Ubuntu? Like, is this uh, kind of like, you know what, we looked at it and we said if, we, if we're going to make the long-term play, we can't go Ubuntu. And isn't that in itself sort of a statement it's like, you know, uh, we've looked at what Canonical's doing. They're obviously more focused on mobile right now. We don't want to bet the farm on that. So let's go with Debian because they're tried and true. Yeah. I, I would say that's definitely part of it. I don't think the mobile thing by itself is, all, you know, is the one go-to thing. I think at the end of the day, I think that they want to be the company running their own show. Yeah. Not having to get permission or, you know, deal with another entity and their policies. They want to basically run yeah. their own program from yeah. the ground up. And yeah. I think that's a smart move. It's more expensive in the long run. But at the same time, I think it's worthwhile for a 10-year plan. I'm actually really excited it is Debian. Now, doesn't it make all the decisions Debian's on the cusp of making more interesting? Systemd, Wayland, right? Yeah. All of these things we're all watching very closely. Now I'm going to be watching even more closely. But I, yeah. I, I think Debian was a great choice. And one of the things they're doing is, and it's interesting, they're still recommending game developers use Ubuntu 12.04 for game development. And the the way they're pulling this off is they have created the Steam runtime environment. Now, oh, that's... Okay. Don't go thinking this is Mono or Java. It's not quite like that. It's more like Docker in a sense. Okay. They are going to have a set of libraries and think of, you know, so when you download a, a, mm -hmm. a Linux application online, sometimes the developers opt to statically link the libraries it needs. So that way, right. you know, you don't have the problem where one distro is version 1.2 of a Developed library and the other one 1.3. Yeah. yeah. So static link, statically linked libraries do, do have the benefit of pretty much running everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, this is kind of like that except for it's not static, right? Steam will be pushing updates to this runtime environment via the Steam client. And so when you install the Steam client, it will come with the Steam runtime environment on any distro. So essentially what Valve has created here is a universal Steam platform that will be dis distro agnostic. So Smart. you are able to develop on Ubuntu 12.04 and then deploy on Debian or Fedora or whatever. And that's brilliant because it really appeals to someone that just wants to get it get, get their you know get their uh, application in right. this case a game right. out the door without the current Linux problem of well, I gotta make sure it runs on this. Oh, I gotta make sure it runs on that. Yeah, get all that out of there. Just make it, you know, like you said, almost like a Docker-like experience for the developer. I think that's pretty slick. Yep, pretty slick. Now, mm. if you don't have UFI, EFI, if you got an AMD card, uh, yeah. because it is almost straight up Debian, turns out. Not that hard to take a base Wheezy install and just make it Steam OS. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, so uh, I got a link in the show notes on the uh, Steam mm. forums. So if you if you got go download Wheezy disk one, load it on your machine, and then you you plug in the two Steam repos. Oh, okay. You pin uh, a couple of repos with higher priority than the Debian repos. Uh, so that way you're pulling right. packages from the Steam repos as opposed to the system repos. You do a you do an app get update mm -hmm. and uh, and then uh, you can see there's a few things you do have to install like get the newer kernel and stuff like that. But it's essentially a seven step process. That's not that hard actually. That's yeah. kind of like well, gee, this is the easy. If, I mean, if you're wow. really hard up and you you just for whatever reason big picture mode doesn't do it for you. Mm -hmm. Which and Matt, like you're a big fan of big picture mode, right? I'm a huge fan. I love the I love the uh, I love the flow. It took me uh, and I wasn't at first. At first, I was definitely against it. But after I played with it for a bit, I've actually found it to be quite uh, quite fun. Yeah, I mean, I thought I thought I remember called you saying like you felt like it was actually almost superior to the straight up legacy Steam interface. In yeah, some that's exactly it. Yeah, because I mean, initially the straight up legacy interface was really it was I, I still don't like it. But I think that big picture <laughs> mode was definitely easier to navigate. Again, I was still wasn't in love with it at the time. But once I played with it a little more, I was kind of like okay. I can actually flow with the logic on it, so because you get, you don't find yourself getting as lost. Yeah. So uh, this right, what you're looking at right now in the video version, this is essentially what SteamOS right. is. If you want to play it, you know, you don't you don't need to go get SteamOS. But if you have Debian Wheezy or you want to go download Debian Wheezy, and you don't want to have to worry about UEFI, you don't want to have to worry about your it has the damn AMD drivers on the on the OS, yeah. right? So all of that can be can it be achieved by just uh, altering a base Debian installation, mm -hmm. which is awesome. That's really accessible and cool. I feel like I feel like this is really demonstrating, um, like, hi, uh, Valve is really making a lot of the right choices. Like, uh, by the way, so uh, one of the things we'll probably have more details on on Linux Unplugged on Tuesday. We're gonna do mo we're gonna do more SteamOS coverage. I'll be playing with it some more, and I think by Tuesday we'll have some Steam hardware beta details. Ooh, yeah. One of the early beta details that has come out right now mm -hmm. is that um, 
the Steam controller works on any Linux OS That's out of cool. the box. Nice. So it uh, and uh, and the uh, Debian uh, uh, the Steam OS Debian kernel has some minor patches applied to it to make right. it even better, but it just works straight up out of the box. Um, oh, also, uh, uh, Popey uh, uh, linked on Google Plus to um, uh, a PPA repo for Ubuntu users. So oh, if right you're on, on Ubuntu and you want to go grab this PPA, you can actually also make turn an Ubuntu installation into a SteamOS installation. Surprise. That's kind of right? cool. Yeah. Right, yeah. Hey, that not, works. Not too surprising. It just needs the right repo. So there's a PPA that I'll have linked up in the show notes for that. I've got a couple of guides in the show notes for getting SteamOS to work in VirtualBox. Now, really, all you're going to be able to do here is play with the GNOME um, desktop, and there's really nothing there. Uh, Steam won't, the Steam interface itself won't work. Uh, so here we go. So I, so speaking of Steam, I finished my SteamOS installation while we were talking here, and right. I'll let it finish. I, I don't even know if it reboots. There it I'm, goes. And we are. So there you should see. It's, it's literally just Debian. That's awesome. Yeah, isn't that awesome? Um, we'll see if I can get to the desktop. Yeah, I'm not sure. We'll see if it black screens it, us just, I think uh, it's going to be okay this time, though. We're getting lots of green read and write. Instead, <laughs> yeah. instead of the red it's, solid we were getting before. It's certainly accessing the disk. What it's doing, though, yeah. I'm not so well, sure. Well, before, it was just it was just kind of like half yeah. accessing. It yeah. was just like, it's just red, red, womp, red, womp. red, red, red. So we're getting more. Uh, it it does know. not work awesome in VirtualBox, nah. as you would expect. It may not work at all. Mm. But I do have guides linked up if you want to go get that taken care of. Mm -hmm. And I've got the torrent file linked where you can just download a bootable ISO. That's seriously the easiest way to do it, especially in VirtualBox. Because yep. in VirtualBox, installing from a USB thumb drive, pain in the butt. Uh, there's also in the show notes a link to a functioning VDI. Um, mm. But it does require, a, when you boot from it, it, it farts right at the very beginning. And I've got the command, the EFI command you need to execute to get it to finish booting. Then it well, that's not too bad. pops up. So if you want to go grab... The GDI, or I'm sorry, the VDI, VDI for, yeah. for VirtualBox, it'll just boot right into the GNOME desktop. That seems like the uh, easiest way to go about that. Yeah. 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 I, uh, we're, we're getting Bubkiss yeah, on Yeah, the, we uh, we got the little... Uh, Bubkiss. Yep. Bubkiss. Bubkiss. Bub Bub That's okay. Bubkiss. That's okay. That's all right. Uh, if you've seen GNOME, you've seen it. It's, it's, so it's essentially just a straight-up GNOME. Uh, you, uh, you log in as the Steam user and with the password of Steam, and then you just get GNOME 3.4 yeah. with the Steam icon on the desktop. That's rare. You're going to go yeah. play games. Yeah. All right, Matt. So, so poi. More Steam coverage down the road. We'll be talking more about it on Linux Unplugged. Mm -hmm. Go check the show notes to get the torrents. Um, read about the XCOMP manager. Read about the Valve Steam runtime. Uh, read about AMD support. All of that's on there. Pharonix is going crazy right oh, now benchmarking. Yeah. Michael was tweeting out last night that he was staying up all night. So a lot of more, lots more stuff. Very stuff. exciting. It, and it looks like a solid delivery from Valve. The Debian base, I give a big thumbs up to. The open hardware... Looking good. Pretty excited about what's going to come nice. for this. All right, Matt. Something else that uh, we've been looking forward to. Own Cloud 6 has been All released. All right. All right. Yep. Now, remember, this is the Own Cloud that introduces collaborative document editing. Okay. Uh, also, big improvements on performance and quality in the code itself. And we talked to Frank. Um, boy. Mm, Half a season ago? Yeah, I was I don't say, know. It's, it's, been it's been a little, a little bit. bit. But little it bit. was like getting towards the release candidates of Own Cloud 6. So if you didn't catch that interview, uh, he is uh, Frank is the founder of Own Cloud, mm -hmm. and uh, we chatted with some of the stuff he's working on. I think it's probably early days for yeah, the I think collaborative you, uh, doc editing. You go to the website and actually search box, you should be able to find it easy enough. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to probably load it up on something. Yeah. You know, give it a test. And Why not? If, if it looks pretty interesting, I'll give it a review here on the show. Mm. Sounds good to me. And congrats to the... I, I've heard mixed things on the, on the, um, on the document editing. I've heard mixed things. Yeah, but you know that's a big that's a big task. So yeah, you know, we'll give them a pass on that. Well, I mean, I it's coming along. It's coming along. Big big project. So this next story, uh, I just had to put in here because um, oh yeah, everybody's loving this story. Uh, so you might have heard about this. Uh, Linus Torvalds. I heard might that guy. indirectly yeah. cause Microsoft to lose millions. Darn. Actually, this is uh, <laughs> this is about that uh, little uh, fat. Patent the fat file system patent that they've mm -hmm. been going after Android device makers and camera makers for, uh, but there was a ruling uh, according to FossPatents.com uh, that the common namespace for long and short file names patent. Uh, there, by the way, uh, Matt, for your own records, mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. ruling EP zero six one eight five four zero. Oh, I better take that down yeah. right now. Yeah, it's, they say the common namespace for short file names is invalid in its entirety including Microsoft's proposed uh, amendments, because the court found that all of the elements distinguishing the patented invention from prior art, uh, which includes Linus Torvalds' post in a mailing list, did not satisfy the technical requirements under the European patent law. Wow. According to a quote given to Fast Patents. Fast Foss. You know, that stuff. Either way. Uh, the Fast Foss. Fast and uh, so, 
we might see a little bit of that money that Microsoft makes in all those You know, and I'm too. looking at the uh, advertisement there, and I'm wondering if that's maybe Microsoft's reaction to the whole si uh, situation. Wah. Yeah. Wah. Little man sitting on the john there. All right. Have you seen uh, Nautilus Next? Have you seen No. This? Okay. No. You ready for this? Uh, so the GNOME team is showing off the oh, new wow. version of Nautilus. Okay. Now, so remember, the my last expectations time, are going to be up here now. You know. The last time we saw an update to Nautilus, I kind of liked it. They collapsed down the yeah. uh, title bar so it looked like tw uh, Twitter picture bars mm -hmm. when you're looking mm -hmm. at a pitter, uh, pitter on Twitter. <laughs> pitter on um, Twitter. So here it is. All right. Let's just, let's just do this, Matt. All right. Deep breath. Uh, so the uh, it's got uh, new view modes which don't look too bad. Don't look no, too bad. No. Uh, and it's got a dynamically re resizable grid the layout. I, where the hell's my stuff? Uh, yeah. Uh, just, so just, geez. And the, really? and the the one that I'm a little worried about myself uh, here is if you scroll down right here, they have um, no. They have like this content view mode, and I'm a little worried about this. But um, uh, you know, wow. This is. Okay, I want to. I, I'm of two minds of this. It does look very nice. Yeah, I mean, it's like I feel like I got KDE treating me like I need options for my options, and I got Gnome going, "Hey, you know, we you don't need to think. Let us do it for you." Ding. You so know. this is the one I have issue with. The new uh, content chooser is designed know. to allow you to select content items from a range of sources. These can be local files or content items stored in the cloud. Hmm. This is where the various new content applications come in. Each yeah. one is designed to act as a cloud-based content provider. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, that could be good. Now that I would actually need before I can make a decision. It could be interesting, it. right? But here yeah. it is. The issue with all of this stuff is it, it requires that anything outside of the core, it, it the core no maps can support this stuff, mm -hmm. but that only gets you so far. Right. Like mm -hmm. If the, the the core gnome photos app is it's not usable. The core, it's, it's the core gnome's music app is is not usable. It's oh. just there's nothing there yet. Uh, I need all of the applications I use on my desktop to take advantage of all these features. Right. And that is something that the KDE desktop has managed to pull off a lot better than... But I also think they have different goals. Again, I'm not, I'm yeah. not a fan well, of either goal set, but I think that's the KDE is like, you, you know, you're, you're, the, you're in the driver's seat, buddy. Go for it. Where no one's like, let us hold your hand and sing kumbaya. You know, it's just like, no. I go back and forth on it because I love the idea of a tightly integrated desktop where everything's talking and sitting right on top of cool things like System D and yeah. all of that. But at the, sa at the same time, it, you got to also live in reality where you have to acknowledge at this point that the desktop Linux is not being used on any touch devices. And you have to acknowledge the reality that not all of the other creators of applications for the Linux desktop are going to embrace every new concept you come up with for the GNOME desktop. And we really are not seeing adoption on a large scale. No. And the fact that Ubuntu and CentOS are going to be sticking with GTK 3.8 for years, because yeah. it's going to be a long-term support well, addition. But I rest easy knowing that GNOME is not interested in logic or making sense or even making decisions that people want. I mean, you know, they've got a mission. They're going to go for it and uh, screw us. So hmm. good job, guys. Yeah. I mean, I I'm don't sorry. know. I, I, I mean, I could blow sunshine up your butts about it, but I mean, at the end of the day, I, I, I honestly, I don't, I don't get what like they're that. doing. Uh, you know, I get, I mean, well, okay, I kind of get it, but it's like, have you ever thought that maybe we don't want to use the things that you're, I don't know. I'm, so where I'm torn uh, on it is, I, it looks, it looks very polished, it looks very well done. Oh well, yeah, it looks and pretty. And it's very thought until out. Until you use it. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> That's just it. It's like, if, 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 the, if the set of applications I can use that are going to support this stuff is getting narrower and narrower, then the benefits That's become the less and less. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I applaud them for, you know, sort of changing up how it renders and how it scales things and all of that. But at the same time, um, you know, after using Dolphin for a while, and then right. I look at yeah. Nautilus, I, yeah. it, it almost seems like Nautilus isn't even, uh, it's almost like a toy. Right. And, now, and I want to be clear. I have not tried this yet. This is based on screenshots and my interpretation of their goals. I want to be very, very clear on that. They could totally blow me away, but based on my understanding of it, it's not something I'm that into i think it kind of sucks um by using it i may do a 180 on that yeah i will try it who knows we'll totally try we'll it. totally try it i may completely turn around but i'll uh, based on early impressions yeah not real impressed as soon as it hits the arch repo no. i'll download it yep. i'll give it a shot sure. i'll see how it goes um and i'll you know and yeah, we'll do a review on it exactly uh I, yeah so i'm glad somebody out there has a has a good strong vision that's always good <laughs> yeah, but are they wearing doggles? I mean, what's going on, guys? I don't. I just don't get it. It's like because it, it looks okay. Pretty only goes so far. But if you're trying to make it to where people can, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they're trying to oversimplify. I, I just don't understand. I don't. Hmm. It's the computer for the next generation, and that actually hold next on there. Sad panda. That could be true. Like the next generation. When I look at my kids, they're growing up on touchscreens. Yeah, and yeah, that's true. But 
Now here's maybe a, you gotta maybe you gotta skate to where uh, the you know I'm gonna go to Best Buy. I'm gonna get me a gnome powered tablet. Oh, that's right, I can't. Ouch. You know, I'm Ouch. just saying, wake up and smell the Folgers, kids. <laughs> God. Wow. Just All saying. Right. All right. Uh, I, I, I'm with you. I'm not quite as fired up, but I'm definitely getting a little like it's funny. <clears throat> okay, and then we'll then we'll move on because I know not, not everybody cares about this, but mm-hmm. it feels like gnome is two steps forward, one step back, or sometimes yeah. one step forward, two steps yeah. back. Like, they introduce classic mode, right? So we get sure. some of our good stuff back. They give us extensions. So that way we can make it a usable desktop. And that's all awesome. And then they kind of butcher the file yeah. manager. Now, maybe this will be a chance for file managers like Thunar to step up and really kind it of... It could. You know, and, and you know... It's good. It's a good file guys, manager. It's great. It's like, okay, you guys are trying to evolve. That's awesome. But for the love of Pete, give us a, give us a rollback option to... Besides having to go and look at a fork, basically, G- give us an option to you know not have the experience be oversimplified. I get what you're trying to do, but don't don't funnel us into it. It's somebody, not comfortable. Somebody in the chat room says that no one wants to be OS 10 when it grows up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, I see what you did there. That's it kind of feels a little Apple heavy-handed, <laughs> and I think that's kind of where some of that yeah. criticism comes from. Uh, Paul Abdul Group said, "You just won the internet on the <laughs> chat room." Ouch! <laughs> Go home, gnome. You're drunk. You know? Yeah, I, I guess at the end of the day, we'll see. I mean, we got Cinnamon, we got XFCE, you got KDE. Yeah, I'm sorry, but Cinnamon destroys it. In my opinion. I mean, I'm not saying Cinnamon's perfect because it's not, but between the two, that's not even a contest. Well, and you look at the f- the features and power of Nemo yeah. compared to what Nautilus is becoming. Because Cinnamon is that midway point between KDE and Derp Derp Gnome. Yeah, and I feel like I can actually use it. You know, it's like, or you know, if you don't, but, KDE's not. Do you remember home. back when um, the uh, Mint project announced they were forking Nautilus and calling it Nemo? And yeah. my reaction was like, okay, I kind of see why you're doing this, but that just seems like it's not even worth it at all. And now, yeah. now it totally seems like it's worth it. Yeah, it totally is. It totally is. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I found Nemo. Yeah, yeah, we did. <laughs> all right, Matt. Well, that's all the news for this week. Buckle up, because we are about to review a Corvette of computers. I, you know, Matt, I've I've been looking forward to this Leopard Extreme review since the day System Seventy Six announced this Same computer. Here. I got a demanding workload in the back end, where in my in the back, Matt. You know, we're in the back. Yeah, I, you know, that's where I keep my workloads. Yeah, in the back. where I got I got your FFmpegs coming out the wazoo, and uh, anything anything that gets my job done faster gets me with the kids, gets me gets me out of the out of the office, whatever it is. That's a good thing, and so. I was really curious if a machine that has a high price point that legitimately you could build yourself was really worth it. And so that was sort of what I set out to try to answer over the last week. Um, So the Leopard Extreme is a desktop custom built from System76. Uh, We'll probably uh, pull it over on the table for the next segment because I'm running on it right now, so it can't really have it up on the table. But I did take some shots. For those of you watching the video version, here's the... uh, it uses a uh, water cool uh, cool CPU from Corsair, and uh, you can see the cooling grill right here. Oh, yeah. On both sides of the uh, water cooler are is the RAM. Oh, uh, as shipped, this has 64 God, gigabytes look of at RAM. That. That's just great. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I've a system I built a long time ago. I used an earlier model of the Corsair, so I'm familiar with these. I really mm-hmm. like these Corsair coolers. I'll talk about how it performed in a little bit. Sure. Uh, going on here, you can see on the back. E-SATA up the wazoo on this, which uh, is good for media production because a lot of times it's your fastest external interface to tr- move large video files between mm-hmm. computers. Like if you uh, want to give somebody a copy of it, if you're doing contract work, a lot of times as part of the deliverable is the actual source files. Ah. And they need it for accounting purposes mm-hmm. and things like that. And the best way I have found to deliver that is a cheap eSATA hard drive. So it's great. This thing has eSATA on the back and has eSATA on the front. Mm-hmm. Uh, it also has a USB 3 powered all the time. It's got USB 2, uh, gigabit obviously, uh, SPDIF out, and uh, surround sound, analog audio out. The case itself is uh, metal. It's well built. It does show fingerprints, though. Sure. Uh, so okay. if you if you know you're manhandling and moving around a lot, which you know you normally aren't with a desktop, but if you do, uh, some fingerprints will show up. I notice, but that usually happens on any cold, flat, makes sense, flat yeah. black metal surface. Good problem to have. Uh, you can see that um, on the front here. Here again, I mentioned the eSATA. We've got mm-hmm. uh, two uh, USB 3.0 ports, a single standard USB 2.0 port, and audio in and out right here on the front, mm. which is really nice. Yeesh. And there's the full front case on itself. It's got. Um, this open space here is is um, for cooling. One of the interesting things that System76 has done is the power supply is actually right here at the very front of the oh, case. Oh, that's bizarre, but I guess yeah. that actually makes sense. What, yeah. what kind of surprised me, though, is 
you know, I was plugging in the, the, the power to the back of it, which is still in the back of the case, mm-hmm. and I realized there's not a power supply on the right. other end of this <laughs> plug. Like, what am I plugging so in? So they have yeah. it wired so that way, and I think it actually works out pretty good for cooling mm-hmm. that way. I think that's what they're <clears throat> going for. Yeah, keeping it directional. And then, of course, uh, it is equipped with uh, uh, many large fans. They move a lot yeah. of air. Um, and, and keeps it quiet because they're nice and big. There's a shot of uh, the shipped with four 7200 RPM, one terabyte hard drives, which I currently have configured in a RAID 0, and then a single Intel uh, 240 gigabyte SSD. And then uh, there's a closer shot of the hard drives. Mm. You can see, uh, by the way, uh, this case has a uh, SATA backplane. So these drives Uh slide in and out. You don't have to worry about cable management. You just slide them in, slide them out. They have little levers on the side and they pop out. You can also see, if you look really closely, there's a 120 millimeter fan Mm -hmm. on the other side of that drive cage, which keeps these drives nice and cool. That's great. Um, There's the back of it where uh, you can see the uh, uh, NVIDIA GTX 760 card. It has two DVI out, HDMI and DisplayPort out. We're currently hooked up to the uh, HDMI right now. And there's the internal shot of the uh, GTX 760. And you can see again on this, two really large cooling fans. That's great. That's really cool. I love that. All the all the wires in there are uh, cable managed. Everything's wrapped. Um, er, uh, the wires you can see these power wires mm-hmm. are in these uh, nylon Basically, sleeves. Basically, like not the way I would do it at home. Yeah. <laughs> my, mine's usually like, oh, this will work. But what, <laughs> thankfully, know? nothing was like. It wasn't like a whole bunch of zip ties. It's all right. Velcro ties. That's so, cool. Yeah. Zip ties are all fun and games until you want to, you know, do something with it. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you always end up having to uh, to break that. So. As as this unit is configured, it is the uh, Core i7-4930. It is running at 3.4 gigahertz. It has six cores with hyperthreading, so in total it shows up as 12 cores to the systems, 12 megabytes of uh, L2 cache, 64 gigabytes of quad-channel DDR3 RAM, and I mentioned the hard drive. And uh, the uh, video card, by the way, has uh, two gigabytes of onboard video. As configured, my estimation is this machine costs about 3000 Three hundred dollars around there, depending mm-hmm. on your, right. depending on how you uh, spec it out. So um, serious rig, serious rig, and all absolutely value wise, totally, totally um, com- uh, um, competitive with the Mac Pro, which is even though it's a different operating system and it's an Apple device. Yeah. In it's my mind, strictly specs. Yeah, in my mind, that's kind of what when I'm looking at the workload that I have for a, a machine like this. That's kind of what I'd be comparing it to. And when you look at the bang for your buck here, this is. This is absolutely coming in closer uh, to value to price. Now, the question is, could you build this yourself? You probably could. I don't know if you can get that specific case, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think if you can build it yourself and you're willing to do that, you're probably not the target customer for this computer. Right. See, I, I can't speak for you, but for myself, I used to build computers for a living, oh, yeah. and I will jump in traffic before I ever do it yeah. again. Yeah. Um, I'm done. I'm, I'm <laughs> done. I, don't want, I want it done for me. Yeah. yeah. It's, part of it is time. Yeah. Uh, and, and also, so the way my life is, is... I probably have enough time to build that PC because that doesn't take that long. Right. But if anything doesn't work, it will sit on my desk for weeks before right. I have time to get back to it. And that is that sucks. Uh, not to mention the System76 offers support. And when you're in a exactly. business and it's a work machine, it's nice to have support contract. And the build quality is, is really just good. top notch. Uh, so why don't we uh, take it for a spin? Now, this is going to be a little visual heavy, but uh, I figured... That's okay. What this is, is something you really want to watch on video anyway. When you got a when you got a computer that uh, is uh, thirty three hundred dollars, you want to make sure <laughs> that it's going to have some life to it, right? Right? Because you've got to you've got to make sure that this is an investment that is going to last probably longer than a year or two when you're spending that kind of money, oh, even though totally, it's a work rig. Totally, right? absolutely. So I'm going to switch over to uh, to. Uh, in fact, why don't I show this? I'll show this yeah, to you. Right? Um, <clears throat> I got right here. Oh, there we go. I'll show you my hard drive setup. Right here is I got. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, it's a it's a, a two hundred and. 180, 180 gigs isn't... I don't know what size that SSD is. But uh, here's the uh, four one terabyte drives, which I currently have set up in a RAID 0 because mm-hmm. I don't care about redundancy. I only move files on there temporarily while they're being right. worked on and they get moved off. I believe it is 180. I was trying to think back to their specs page. And yeah, I think that's right. That I think sounds that's, okay. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, I, I uh, Let's see. Did I benchmark that? I benchmarked this. Oh, yeah, I did benchmark this. So I benchmarked my RAID 0, and you can kind of see uh, here... Uh, I have there's a there's a range of performance, but it's pretty great. Um, wow. w- when you look at the uh, so it was 10 megabyte sample size. My average read to my RAID zero was 165 megabytes a second. My average write was 95 megabytes a second. This wow. is exactly in line with what I would need to do uh, seeking in a video editor to to 
have a fast render, things like that. That's perfect. That's right in the sweet spot. It's going to get spot. the gerb done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, of course, all of the applications in the OS would be running from the SSD, which performs even better. You could also throw this into a redundant array if you wanted to, but I was just going for raw dog speed. Mm. Uh, so there you go. That's my drive setup. Now, um, why don't I show you kind of the headroom you have on this thing? Because yeah. it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty impressive here. So uh, I've got, uh, I made a little FFmpeg script that uh, we'll pull up. Remember talking about FFmpeg oh, yes. a little bit ago. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, one of the things that I use uh, FFmpeg for is to encode WebM files. So I've got a couple episodes of recent uh, Jupyter Broadcasting Productions here on the RAID 0. And uh, I'm going to just go ahead and start encoding the most recent episode of TechSnap into FFmpeg. Okay. Or, I'm sorry, into WebM. And you can all open up System Monitor. You can already see um, there's. Uh, I love all the cores. That's great. I know, right? It's like, just like more it's like a wall. cores. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it, when I open that up, it, it, you know, to see twelve CPUs yeah. listed is pr it's pretty badass. And you gotta have a big screen just to see the cores. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just like wow, that's awesome. So you can see it's starting to work right now, and it definitely uh, is encodes WebM faster than any other machine I have. Not not a big surprise there, yeah, right? Sure. Sure. Uh, and 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 FFmpeg is great. You know, I know a lot of folks also like to use Handbrake. So uh, why don't we also start off a encode of something on Handbrake? So I'll take uh, the latest episode of the Faux Show here. I'll drag it into a Handbrake. I'll set it to our Jupiter Broadcasting mm -hmm. Standard 720p x264, and uh, I'll kick that off. So now we'll run this FFmpeg encode at the same time that we're doing WebM as we're running Handbrake to do x264. Now what's incredible. What is amazing is if you watch this handbrake, uh -huh. you can see it's, it's... Oh, I'm actually seeing it move, and you're encoding yeah. two different files with two different Look programs it. at you, the same time. You actually can see the progress bar Holy just crap. moving. So right now it's clocking at 185 frames per second. <laughs> and, I mean, and that's not even just by itself. That's what Now we just oh peaked up to God. 204 frames per second. God. This is at 30 frames. This video is 30 frames per second. So anything above 30 frames right. per second is faster than real time. Right, and look at this. You can just see it's rocking, and you still got room on the CPU. Yeah, I'm so watching that, it's like holy crap. This is why I go. This is great. Obviously, I'm not having any I/O contention issues. No. I'm encoding two videos. I wonder, like, what kind of headroom do I have on a rig like this? So I thought, uh, while we have that going, why don't we also go play a little Strike Suit Zero? Right, because when you're time. encoding games, you don't want to sit. And, it's like watching bo a water boil. You want to play some games man, while you're encoding. I'm a busy two, man, two and things. if I got a few minutes of downtime while I'm waiting on the encoder, why, why not play some video games? Absolutely. So I figured. Uh, Met uh, I got Metro Last Light on here, but it takes a long time to get started. But I also was playing that while mm -hmm. I was encoding. But Strike Suit Zero, uh, great space shooter game. So here we go. We've got we've got <laughs> WebM encoding oh in the God. background. We've also got an X264 file, file encoding at about 190 frames per second. And uh, now we're going to go in here and play a little Strike Suit Zero while we do that. And I'll go into the more recent mission here. And... Uh, this, uh, this is just, a great It's game. not even missing a beat. It just doesn't care. It's just oh, no, like, and, boom. No, it's totally ready to it's go. Just, it's just like... <laughs> so there we go. So now... Oh, my God. And if I jump out... If I jump out... And it didn't even flinch. You can see we're, we still have the video encoding going. But, you know... But, uh, That's awesome. I think it's the other and it's still flying. Oh yeah, so we'll go back in here real quick. In so you can see we're we're still flying around now. If, however, uh, Matt, I have a little confession to make. Okay. I I have pretty bad ADD. No, so, yeah, no, I'm right there with you. Yeah, so sometimes when I'm uh, playing my video games. Uh, I also like to watch an uncompressed 18 gigabyte Blu-ray movie at the same time. So what I'm going to do over here, just for uh, just for experimentation purposes, is I have got uh, just recently for the kids. I like to back up uh, the Blu-rays, right? Sure, just in case, sure. just Absolutely. in case they get a little crazy just with them get or something damaged. like that. Yeah, got to be prepared. So for I've got just I happen to have Bolt. Uh, it's an 18 gigabyte uncompressed. Well, it's no more compressed than Blu-rays itself, mm -hmm. sitting on my hard drive. HD? Yeah. A, oh, yeah. Oh, full, that's full serious. Blu oh, yeah, that's Blu-ray, yeah. It is straight-up Blu-ray quality. There's zero quality loss from mm -hmm. the Blu-ray disc itself, sitting on the same hard drive. So now we are going to go ahead and watch a Blu-ray movie at the same time that we are encoding two video files simultaneously at 190 frames per second. Now I will jump down, or I'll go right back into <laughs> Strike Suit Zero and continue to play Strike Suit Zero with zero issue. God. And you could, I mean, this, what I'm, what we demonstrate here is the headroom on this computer is intense, right? I mean, obviously at this point, you know this thing's going to be able to last you for a couple of years, right? Yeah. Now, what's great about this is I'll, I'll jump out. 
uh, is now we really get to see where the water cooling comes in. Oh yes. Uh, so oh, we don't uh, necessarily we don't need to keep uh, Blu-ray because yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll get pulled down. But uh, the Blu-ray plays continuously in the totally. background. So if I drop down the uh, video, you can see right now our physical CPU is at 104 degrees on average. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> Now, the oh, other computer awesome. I use in wow. the other room yeah, yeah. idles at 106 degrees. Okay, so with all that going on, you're, with the liquid cooling, you got 104 Fahrenheit, but yeah. the, and the other computer idling at 100. Oh, my God. Yeah, uh, so wow. I, uh, I ran uh, the Valley Benchmark uh, to get the GPU as hot as possible because I figured mm. I figured if I could heat this sucker up with the GPU, that might heat the overall right. thing that up. Was our, that was the goal. Yeah. So after two hours of running loops of encoding video and... And having the uh, Valley Benchmark running, I managed to finally get the CPU core up to 138 degrees. <laughs> now, when my other rigs encode, they usually are around 160, wow. 165, and the only thing they are doing is encoding the video. So I thought that was pretty awesome. But what's really great, and of course not too surprising, is uh, if I kill these encodings, which I'll go ahead and do now, uh, the CPU recovers really fast. Probably oh, it just dropped right down. Yeah, Ooh. so now we're already down to 86 degrees. And what, there was no... There was no Oh my, I mean, it just dropped like a rock. Yeah, that water cooling brings it right wow. back down. Um, and and uh, at the same time, you guys can't tell, but there was no increase in uh -uh. fan noise here in the studio. No, I, I, I never heard anything. Yeah. Uh, and so now uh, now we're down to 81 degrees Fahrenheit. <sighs> pretty pretty incredible. Uh, there were, Of course, this the GTX 760 is not the most powerful GPU on the market. In fact, no, you can no. get a, you can get a uh, even nicer one available sure. from System76. Mm -hmm. But you're still doing this with this particular I, card. I actually, like, I couldn't, I could not sit here and tell you you should probably get a higher end video card. I don't know if there's anything mm -hmm. in Linux that can push this system. Um, I tried a game, I tried yeah. Gone Home, which is a very graphically intensive game. Like I mentioned, I also tried Metro Last Light. Yeah. Very graphically intensive. And at no point did I, uh, did I ever have any performance issues. I'll show you the benchmark here in a second from the Valley uh, benchmark. Oh, all right, cool. Just one more visual, I thought, just because this game is so beautiful. It's called uh, Gone Home. And uh, it's a, it's not, it's not a shooter. It's more like a mystery. Okay, so you're wandering around solving. Stuff. And by the way, I know we we over mentioned this last week, but I think it's it bears repeating. All of this is happening with video mirroring, right? I'm mirroring. Oh yeah, the, right. Yeah. So you're actually mirroring H, your yeah. HDMI out to. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm doing a full 1080p wow. mirror of everything so, we're doing. So, so not only we did all that, but we mirrored it on top of it. Jeez. Yeah. I know, right? Jeez. I mean, you, you can see the the uh, the the headroom. Oh, the door's locked. So that's uh, gone home, and it's it's a beautiful game. You, uh, and all right, so let me pull up the uh, the uh, um, uh, the uh, 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 Valley benchmark. So uh, here is the Bonobo. We did this one last week. Yeah. You can see the Bonobo got an overall score of twelve hundred and two. And for those of you who don't know, that's his laptop. Yeah. Yep. And it had a max frame rate of forty nine frames per second, which I was pretty happy with. Yeah. With a, that's with really a laptop. good. Uh, but not too not too surprising. Same exact settings across the board. Uh, oh, the Leopard Extreme comes in at 1900, and the maximum <laughs> frame rate is 76 frames per Jeez. second. Jeez. Yeah, uh, and that is uh, 4x anti-aliasing. It's maximum resolution 1080p, mm. highest visual settings. Uh, very awesome. So you got great disk I/O. Yeah. Uh, and you've got a couple of different options there. Uh, they didn't ship it in any particular RAID configuration. I opted to put it in a RAID zero. I could have put it in anything else, of course. So you had the flexibility to kind of test out things. And yeah, and you can also you. get it with a hardware RAID controller. I did soft RAID, which is fine for mm -hmm. what my purposes are. Uh, the other thing that's nice is because it is um, fairly modern, everything mm -hmm. works out of the box with, without any proprietary drivers. Um, I even, in fact, accidentally played uh, a couple of video games with the Nuvu driver and didn't realize it. <laughs> Holy crap! And then, and then I was like, "Oh!" Then one of my benchmarks didn't work properly, and right. I was like, "Oh, that's because I used yeah. the other driver." Oh, and yeah. uh, so now I've put the the proprietary NVIDIA driver on there. But other than that, uh, nothing else is required. It does have UEFI, so that sometimes adds a little bit of a uh, curveball. But right. I reloaded Ubuntu just to see if that was a problem, and it yeah. was not. I'd be really curious to see how this thing performs with Arch. I decided because oh, yeah. this is such a great product, and I, I wanted to try it out with Ubuntu on right. Here. Yeah, to give the actual experience. Sure. And I had to modify some of my benchmarks to make that happen. But uh, I think in the end. Uh, I'd be really curious to see, because like, uh, one of the things we did is this Ultra Pro mm -hmm. had Ubuntu on it last week, and now this week it has Arch on there, right. and uh, you know it runs even faster under Arch, which is <laughs> kind of amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Gorgeous. So I'd be curious to see if the Leopard Extreme would exhibit uh, th that same kind of, of behavior. Uh, I threw everything I could really think of, and including, tr um, I, I even... Uh, I probably shouldn't say this. I even had it ne next to a heater for a little while to see if I could cause it well, to... Well, right, right. No, yeah. that's okay, because that's part of the benchmarking. Well, it's just yeah. figured people put it under their desks and right. there's vents down there, exactly. so I put it down by my heater just to see 
what the heck happens. Right. And See, that's, we get that temperature to bring up. That was when I got it to 138 after running it for hours like that. So uh, you really had to push that thing hard to even get that temp up. That's great. It's it's. Mm. I wish there was. I wish there was a way to everybody just to to just try it for a little while because it's yeah. so great to just know that. Um, sometimes on a laptop, you you feel like you're kind of hitting the wall. Like you might have a Core i7 in there. Maybe you even have dual SSDs. But the bus or something about it is still at the end of the day a laptop, and yeah. it, it'll only go so far. And I feel like during the review of this Leopard Extreme, I never met its edge. I it's like I never was able to turn it up loud enough. To, to make the speakers distort, you know that kind of thing. Like mm -hmm. I, I never could. Mm -hmm. So, to me, that is an indicator that it, it probably has several years of life in it. That even today, with the best games on Linux and the best benchmarks and the and you know encoding X two sixty four video and all yeah. of that, I still was not able to reach its limit. I think that to me is an indicator that eventually it will reach a limit when things yeah. get <laughs> yeah. larger and sure, bigger. Sure, but certainly. it's going to take quite a while. So when I look at it for me, from a business standpoint, this would be a business purchase, yeah, uh, and I think it would be justifiable. I think if you're an enthusiast and you're willing to build yourself, you know, you could get some pretty that close option. to this. Yeah, because yeah, as you pointed out, it's different different strokes for different folks, different audiences, but for someone like us... Let's get it. Let's get yeah. it done. And let's get it pre-configured. I know? also, oh, by the way, the chairman's asking. Um, I was thinking about putting SteamOS on it too, just for a couple of days. <laughs> you know, I don't know why not, right? Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Pretty good rig. If you've got any questions, if you've been thinking about getting it, you can email us Linux Action Show at jupiterbroadcasting.com or show up on Tuesday for Linux Unplugged when we do the follow up segment. You can join us in the mumble room and ask your questions. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful. I'm hoping that with the holidays and whatnot, System76 will let us uh, hang on to it for a little while so I can try Arch, I can try SteamOS. So. I've also gotten a few Cross requests to try Windows. Interesting. I think people want a dual boot. It's got an Asus motherboard yeah. in there, so it also might be Hackintoshable. I don't know. Well, and I know that System76 actually will provide you Windows drivers if you want to go and download them for the machines that you do purchase. Oh. So you're not having to look for them. They, they're they not going to advertise that because it's not what they're going for, but yeah. they do have them available if you need to go that route. You know, it's one of the things I've, so. I've heard mentioned and I just wanted to make a quick thought on is people say that, you know, it is essentially a custom-built PC that they repackage. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I look at that is that's actually, to me, a benefit because... I can replace any one of the individual components. It's yeah. a standard power supply. It's remember a Dell OEM uh, uh, power power units? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. The power yeah. I remember units. them oh. badly. I remember them very badly. <laughs> Good luck replacing um, those. <laughs> so I like the fact that it's all parts that, if in, at the end of the day, I could get it from Newegg, I get it from Best Buy, I could get it from Amazon, uh, and I could put it in my machine and get back right. up and running. So I think that's actually a perk when you consider the fact of the build quality and the overall presentation and the support package they offer with it. So totally. I give it a big thumbs up if you can afford it. Thirty three hundred dollars is is right in line with a professional grade workstation. Exactly. I think it's I think it's priced very reasonable, um, and uh, I, I would I I would very much, very much. I wish I was in a position to buy one yeah, because right? yeah. the fact that I was encoding two videos at once on one rig and it still had more room to go. Tell, probably you're already picturing out your day. It's like oh my god, yeah. I have free time. Well, what am I going to do with that? It yeah. also means yeah. I could reclaim one of the computers I have dedicated now and then I could do something else to speed right. up. The, so it's not just the encoding's faster, but it's also would be freeing up other equipment because of the performance differential mm -hmm. that I could use that other equipment to get something else done even faster. So it'd be it, there's a multiple effect there. So there's a multiplier. So it, it, it's definitely a good value in that sense. Goodness. So, the Leopard Extreme from System76, I give it two really big thumbs up. I would, too. I've been looking forward to trying this guy I know, we've been, we've, been, we've been chomping at the bit for, oh, my gosh, seems like months now. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Very good stuff. So, uh, go over there and, you know, just spec one out and see what you think. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe one day I'll get my very own Leopard Extreme. Ooh. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. But Matt, did you know? Did you know this very segment right here is brought to you by the good folks over at System Seventy Six? Good stuff. Uh, and I also I wanted to uh, put the uh, Leopard Extreme up on the table that way you guys could get a look at the physical dimensions of it. Uh, so go over to System Seventy Six, check out all of their machines. This is one of them, obviously, but there's a bunch of other really great ones, including the Ultra Pro, which I'm working on right now as uh, we do this segment. The Ultra Pro. Currently running the Arch and uh, running great, runs Ubuntu like a champ too. That's what it ships right. with. Uh, oh, the week the week that I've had this, I've gone through a lot of um, emotional discovery. <laughs> you could call it. You Lots know, of twirling in circles and yeah. holding it and me and, uh, like yeah. like having conversations with Ange. Like Ange, I don't think I can send this back, sweetie. You know, kind of like I I, I, I know the feeling like with that, the other laptop. The yeah. conversation was like I've met another woman. 
and her name is Ultra Pro. Uh, why don't we? <laughs> while we got this, before we get to the emails too, uh, let's see if I can manhandle this. All right, and uh, I'll show you guys a little bit of the internals. I popped off the sides so that way you can see the insides. The yeah. sides literally pop on and off. Uh, they are uh, they. There's like little. Um, Little things they click into. It, yeah. It's actually really nice. This side does it too. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And yeah. anyone that's ever built computers knows that's uh, you know no no yeah. no bloody bl 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 bloody knuckles. So there's the uh, there's the internals right there. It's a kind of heavy, yeah. but you know what Matt was pointing out is that oh here we go. It's solid. Is this is actually smaller than the last model? It is a little yeah. It is a little bit smaller, yeah. and it's uh, which is nice because the last model was really big. You yeah. know, so this is a good size for it. And what I'll do here is so you can kind of get an idea is I'll pop off the side. Oh yeah. Just See, they, right it off. just pops right off. And then uh, if you look, if you really want to geek out, you can see here is the uh, back plane for the SATA cage, where you can see they just it's a hot swappable bay. So you can just add and you can see it's on the left there. Yeah. There's a, yeah. That's Boy, pretty nice. That is good stuff. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, I, I like, I really like uh, the hard drive cage because uh, for production, you know, terabyte is good for now because together it's four terabytes. That's, right. that's plenty. In a year, I might need. To, I might want to swap these out. Maybe I want to swap them out. And it's totally with, doable. Just boop. Yeah, it, it's, there's two little brackets right here. You mm -hmm. pop off, and then you just slide it right out. You don't have to worry about any wire management or anything. It's just really Good cool stuff. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, sure. sure you even sure. got a bay here if you uh, want to go old school and go optical. You can. Yeah, you, you could go. Optical and optical is also a build to order yeah. option. You could uh, select to go optical when you're. This, you know, I uh, ended up going with a, just a like I I was playing around. And I decided to put a USB CD-ROM on it for the little oh, yeah. stuff that I needed, but mm -hmm. almost now you don't even need it. You really don't. No. Yeah, uh, I really care. like this. So I just I really like this drive cage because every every machine yeah. I build now I try to put something like that in there. Also, the case has the uh, back of the CD uh, of the CPU exposed, nice. so you don't have to disassemble the whole damn thing. Oh, to see, that's what I'm talking. Yeah. That's what I like. Yes, yes. yes. All right. Yes. Well, why don't we get to some feedback? Yeah. We have a follow-up from the feedback from last week. Sent in by Git Poked, which is kind of funny now in uh, retrospect. Uh, he says, uh, oh, God, she moved out and left me. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, just kidding. I want to thank you guys for uh, taking this up on the show. Based on what I took from the show and the thread, I uh, hooked her up with Kubuntu. Oh, I was yeah. going to just stick with Arch, but I figured in the long run, a curated release is better for her. Mm -hmm. She won't be recognized. She won't be agonizing over which window manager to install this right. month. Exactly. She's been using it pretty much with no issue. I do have to make her .sh files for any non-Steam games she plays, stupid optimist. But past that, she's been perfectly content. She watches her video games, streams, uh, and browses the web, mm -hmm. and of course, plays web games. She digs the computer, seems much faster than its price would entail, and she isn't getting viruses or browser malware when she downloads her add-ons for her games. And that's a win for you. Yeah. She does not dig that uh, the fan often comes on for certain Flash websites. Sure. So, yeah. She's not completely sold. She knows if she wants to play a certain game, she has to boot her Windows computer up, mm. and I saw her on there last night, but it's going pretty well. Big thanks to Matt in particular. You quietly sit at one point. Don't bother worrying about the package manager and driver versions. Make sure she enjoys the UI and experience. That was some good advice. I showed her installing Steam was so easy on Linux before, and her care level was zero. <laughs> when I showed her she could change the window decorations and icon themes, just like her Android, her eyes got all beady with her head and exploded with joy. Exactly. That's what they. That's what you know. That's what you really got to hit on. You know, for non geeks, that's really what they want. Yeah. Yep. 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 All right. Uh, planned obsolescence. I thought this was a good topic because, despite. <clears throat> You know, the fact that I get a lot of new phones, I constantly want new computers. I actually hate consumerism. I, yeah, I think it's clearly. <laughs> I know. I, I know. I, I'm, 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 a, I'm not very uh, consistent on this message. I acknowledge no. that. Uh, but that's particularly because, you know, you know all, I, all of our shows are so tech focused. That but I, try I to think stay. it's not that you hate consumerism. I think it's you hate uh, corporate cronyism. I think that, that? You, that that's really, it's just, I, you I want also, to vote where you put your dollars. You know, you know, like this whole like must buy everything mentality and got to have right, all these things. Right. and. And, you know, what really gets me is with tablets and phones, they're the opposite of this Leopard Extreme. Tablets really and are. phones are like one-year, two-year devices yeah. tops, and the batteries really start to fail. Mm -hmm. The apps and the operating systems get too heavy, uh, and they don't last that long. Right. Uh, it, not like stuff used to last in some regards. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, Rinkoa Rinko, uh, wrote in on the subreddit, and I just like this one a lot. I wanted to feature it here in the show. He says, hi, everyone. First off, I'm new to the forums. Uh, well, welcome. So I was wondering, since uh, on last, Chris and Matt always talk about the newest hardware, what do people actually think about planned obsolescence? As example, two years ago, I got a Samsung Galaxy S2. Uh, and from today's perspective, it's already old. Yeah, see, exactly. Yeah, this is exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. Uh, however, I think if I pay 200 bucks for a phone, it should last a bit longer than two years. 
Now, of course, if you stick with the phone manufacturer, upgrades generally stop after a while. Uh, he says, uh, I think I got to Android 4.12 on mine. And you'll have to buy a newer device if you want to keep it up to date. However, if you take matters into your own hands, this can easily be circumvented. Like, you know, he's currently running Android 4.3.1 because oh, okay. he's okay. got a CyanogenMod mod or yeah. something. I guess what I'm getting at is it wouldn't be cool to give people... It, uh, I guess what I'm getting at as wouldn't it be cool to give people tips and tricks on how to make the best out of the devices they already own? Kind of like in addition to X runs Linux, this 500-year-old device still runs Linux. Cheers. You know, not knowing anything about the legalities or licensing headaches or other hassles, but I don't see this as being impossible to perhaps offer a service to where people have existing Android phones that have kind of hit end of life. And, uh, you know, then being able to sit down with them as a consultant and uh, explore their options. Well, and this was honestly, that'd be kind of cool. This is one of the promises that I'm going to mention it. Everybody get upset. Ubuntu (laughs) Touch kind of offered. They kind of did, yeah. It's a distro that you could put on your own Mm -hmm. Android device. And hey, carriers, you got some extra stock of, uh, you know, Nexus S's sitting around. Why don't you put this image on it or whatever, right? I mean, that might be a bad example, but, or Nexus 4's or whatever. Right, yeah. Um, I I agree, and obviously uh, this this planned obsolescence um, only benefits our corporate overlords like That's true. Samsung and HTC, and you know everybody that makes chips from the top to bottom. Now, uh, you know, we were talking on Linux Unplugged on Tuesday about how some of our local lugs are really hyper focused on getting Linux running on the oldest hardware possible. Yeah, yeah, kind of the puppy Linux crowd. Type there, stuff. there is absolutely a community out there. Like Q5Sys, you know, he, he works on uh, Puppy Linux all the time. Right. Right, and uh, right, Q5 is Puppy Linux, and he's constantly making, you know, the, uh, a great micro distro that runs great on small hardware. <laughs> and I, I look at that, and I, there, I think what it is, is there is a very active community there doing that stuff, but it's just yeah. not flashy. It's not flashy, but I think it has its place. I think when you're looking at people that may not have a computer access to a computer otherwise, yeah. or um, schools, schools would be another one. Nonprofits, um, anything to where you're not looking for the latest and greatest, or you just don't have the means to do so. Um, it's a very practical approach. Yeah, and I, you know, like you, if you if you dig under the surface, if you, it's, the problem is the new devices or what everybody wants to know about. People want to hear people's thoughts and opinions. Uh, I'm constantly curious where platforms are going. That's why I tend to stay up to date on phones and yeah. hardware, impossible because I, I, you know, I. I feel like coverage for on our shows that's important, but I, if I if I was living like a like if I got sucked into the Nexus like Captain Kirk, yeah. I'd probably be back chopping wood and running old computers and I'd just be happy, right? But I'm not yeah. Captain Kirk in the Nexus, right? I'm Chris sitting here doing a podcast about technology. I mean, yeah, I'd probably be doing something along that line. Maybe I don't know, living up in Alaska somewhere, making hacky sacks for people that still play hacky. Yeah, don't sacks. you get like a thousand bucks a year because of oil? Alaska? Uh, yes, just... it, for, you got to be a property owner. You got to be there. Oh. I think it's at least a year, and um, and of course it fluctuates. It's, yeah, uh, I forget the actual uh, name of it. But just saying that could be a that could yeah. be a uh, that could be a strategy right there. And with the cost, you know, with four or five dollar gallon of milk, uh, it kind of comes yeah. out to a cost yeah. of living thing. So, yeah, but yeah, technically yeah. speaking, if you're property, you owner, know yeah. what? You're right, Matt. It's just easier to get Bitcoin rich. Yeah, it's just, it, yeah. it really is. You know? uh, <laughs> so, anyways, uh, great thoughts on that. We're gonna have um, We're gonna have two back to back Linux unplugged recordings. On Tuesday. In fact, yep. the whole Jupiter Broadcasting week is kind of cray cray. Uh, so go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get all the latest stuff. We are gearing up for the holidays, the holiday week. Most of our shows will be off, Eesh. but we are pre recording next week for that holiday week. Mm-hmm. So uh, starting Monday, we're going to have a double quota radio back to back. The second quota radio is going to be a call in episode in the Mumble Room. So if you'd love to, we'd love to have you join us and, and call in to quota radio in the Mumble Room. Just show up live and in the chat room, we'll give out the Mumble details. Uh, double Linux Unplugged on Tuesday. And I got I got some ideas for our Linux Unplugged topics. I think they're going to get deal. people fired up. And then a double tech snap on Thursday. Lots of stuff. And then a regular Unfilter and Sidebite on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. And should have a regular faux show on Friday or Saturday. Just check the calendar for that. Big week, though. Big week. Yeah, yeah Big absolutely. Week. All right. So I think that's everything. If you've got any questions about the hardware we reviewed or if you'd like to join us for a live show, go check out our calendar, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. And don't forget, we're also live on Sundays for this very show over at jblive.tv. As far as I know, we don't have any unusual plans because it seems like last misses all the holiday days. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so I think think we're just going to be our regular Sunday stuff for Linux Action Show. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. And it, <laughs> I wish I had more numbers after that. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.
Oh, I have a little bit of a headache. Uh-oh. And three. Uh, three. It's a phone run. Google Hangouts or uh, Helpouts, you know. Awesome idea unless you had a Google Checkout account at some point in your life. Then your life's going to suck balls. Really? Oh, yeah. Jeez, you know that you know that hanging fish that you used to... Okay, backstory. I've been asking my wife forever. Every year, I say, please get me the Jiggly Jigglers. I, I've been asking for these forever because I want them in my office. You know that? She these? totally won't do it. Oh, my God. It's been on my wish list for years. Yeah, so this is like that fish, oh. and it just sings. Is that a... What yeah, the? they, they actually... And they actually... Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's yeah. a whole other piece of equipment there. Yeah. <laughs> it's and then, like, I turn around and all of a sudden, boom, sex toys. Just boom, sex toys. Awesome. Oh, this was great. I went to Cabell's. I looked at uh, some smokers, and uh, then uh, yeah. Santa was gone. Out to lunch. Yep. Out to lunch. So I sat down in Santa's chair and took myself one of his candy canes and just enjoyed <laughs> myself for a little bit. Oh hi, just hanging out with my girl, me and my girl, leopard. Now what are you doing here? This got awkward. Oh no! Don't look! Don't look! <laughs>